Hello, you're watching Cherry Red TV. Uh, my name's Mark Powell and I'm a label manager for Esoteric Recordings, a, a Cherry Red label. And I'm pleased to say that with me today is uh, Jan Shellhas, who has just got a new album out on uh, Esoteric Dark Ships. Jan has uh, been a, an integral member of the band's Camel and Caravan, but he's also uh, performed with people such as Thin Lizzy and uh, various other bands. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you here today, Jan. Thanks for it's coming on. Thanks. Um, as I just mentioned in the introduction, you know, you've worked with a, a wide variety of people. You're probably most commonly associated with the, your work with, with Camel and, and Caravan. Um, but your roots in music go back to Liverpool of the, of the mid-60s. Can you um, tell us, because you actually played at the Cavern and places like that, could you yes. actually sort of... Uh, yeah. Do you have any anecdotes in that time? What was the first band you were actually in? Well, uh, in those days, you, you started off way, way back at school. Uh, and... It was a sort of badge of honour to be coming in uh, in sixth form with, with uh, bags under your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, mainly, the, there's lots been talked about uh, already about Liverpool in the 60s. I mean, there's reams and reams of information about that. People have had stories of this, stories of that. But uh, quite a lot of people don't actually mention what the places and the, the things actually smelt like. The city's actually got certain smells about it. You know, For example, I mean, there's the... Uh, I think in the heart of every Scouser, deep down, there's a memory somewhere of ferry diesel and Mersey water. <laughs> you know, these, these are things that you don't forget, even when you get to, to quite advanced years. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that was reflected in, in, the, in the music that came out of Liverpool well, at that time? Well, once again, I hate to labour the, the, the aromas side of things. <laughs> but uh, uh, the cavern itself had, had very distinctive things about it from the lunchtime sessions to the evening sessions. Um, I mean, obviously, the excitement was the band and, and the, the unique uh, pounding bass and uh, bass drum together. You used to flap trousers and shake chests, and this made it so exciting. That's why the, you know, all these videos you, you see at the place don't quite capture that. But also, I mean, you, you get things like the, the smells there were, were sort of three hands disinfectant and minus hair lacquer mixed in with uh, uh, stale tomato soup and stewing hot dogs you know the, <laughs> the whole thing was a, created this uh, soup of excitement you know the, it's an, I think anyone that was there at the time will remember that but I'm afraid everything else is down to uh, just uh, archive material which everything loses loses the, the immediacy of it doesn't it when, when you get archive stuff but uh, yeah so uh, First time played at the cavern actually it wasn't until I was in a soul band, strangely. Um, but uh, before that, uh, as I say, people in bands were just uh, at school and doing weddings and things. And it was, uh, it was a in those days you, you would uh, maybe go out and do f three or four gigs in an evening from one to the other, maybe even a half hour set. And uh, you'd have people waking you up at two in the morning to go and do yet another one for three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and it was. Uh, I mean, to say it was an exciting time would be a bit of an understatement, but at the time, it, it's like everything else, it seems quite normal at the time. Well, I suppose at that time, Liverpool was pretty much sort of centre of the musical world with the Beatles and the Mersey Beat thing. I mean, did you actually uh, see the Beatles play at the, the uh, Cavern yourself? Sadly, I just missed that. Just missed it. The, the first band I saw at the Cavern was the Undertakers, strangely. <laughs> uh, but... Regardless of that, instantly smitten, of course, with the uh, as a, all the things we've already mentioned about sound and excitement and stuff. Um, but the one that uh, was memorable was when the Mersey Beats played down there. As the, they were one of the bands that started sort of uh, encroaching into the, the loud, louder side as opposed mm. to just the, the old-fashioned stuff. And they had big amps and big guitars and an even bigger sound that was already there anyway. So it's it was just like, I want to do this. <laughs> I think it was in the minds of most, most musicians at the time. Brilliant. Excellent. So you started off playing bass guitar uh, in, yes. in, a, in a band. Yeah. Um, so what was the, the first band you, you were in that recorded was um, which band? That was Bernie and the Buzz Band. Um, we'd gone down to London and uh, did an audition, strangely, for I think it was Don Arden. And uh, he liked what he heard and he gave us a record contract with DRAM. Um, we recorded, the, the first 
tune we tried didn't go too well, but the second one uh, we seemed to get on with was a track called Don't Knock It, it was a Sam and Dave number, and we seemed to, we seemed to click with that one, um, and it went down rather well in Liverpool, <laughs> but uh, it was, uh, yes, it was the, that, that, was, that, was the first, that was the first record we had, uh, and I think oh, it was after that. We did do a second one, which uh, I think Aretha Franklin uh, used, called House That Jack Built. Uh, so in effect, we actually did a demo for them, <laughs> for that one. But uh, yeah, that was, uh, that, was, uh, that was our first encroachment down to London, was uh, in, the, in the old soul bands. Because at that time, as, as you were saying to me earlier, there was the, the psychedelic thing was sort of coming in as well, with, with mixing with, with, uh, alongside the soul movement. Um, mm. So... Was there uh, anything that actually... What, what was the defining thing that actually made you switch from playing bass guitar to, to uh, keyboards? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd like to say it was something, uh, <laughs> something really romantic and exciting, but it was something as straightforward in those days is that uh, if there's a gig going, if you didn't play the instrument for the gig, then the gig, you played what, you, what was needed. So in other words, someone once said... Uh, we haven't got a gig for bass, but we need a keyboard player. And so, uh, luckily I knew a few chords, and, and it progressed from there. That's, that's how it started. And uh, once I'd actually begun to do that, those produced the first glimmerings of actually being able to write stuff. Because for some reason, uh, I never wrote anything when I was playing bass, but as soon as I moved to keyboards, I think the harmonic structure of um, chords began to, began to set... Uh, bells going in the in the writing area of the brain somewhere <laughs> so that was when I first decided I think I needed to write something right so so was that soon after that you actually uh, played with the scaffold yes it wasn't too long to be honest uh, we, we'd uh, we paid our dues in some of the clubs so we'd honed our skills a little bit as did most bands by doing lots and lots of late night gigs so uh, we were doing a gig in the place called O'Connor's in Liverpool which was, as I mentioned earlier, a bit of a melting pot for poets, musicians, uh, bands like Liverpool Scene, Roger McGough, and of course The Scaffold. Um, Roger saw us there and asked us if we'd like to do some work with them on their uh, forthcoming project, which was something called Zones, I think it was called. And it was a collection of sketches to be performed at the uh, Everyman Theatre in Liverpool. Uh, that project was then taken up to Edinburgh for the festival which that went down quite well and for a short time we, we, we did a strange mixture of, of um, university gigs like that and theatre gigs and then uh, on a Saturday we, we, the lads would quickly change into white suits and do Lily the Pink <laughs> 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 and, we, and, and we'd switch to black polo necks and disappear into the background <laughs> Mm. So you, you didn't actually uh, record with the scaffold then? On, on actually, we did. Yeah, did uh, it was one of those EMI um, things. I think I, I did something called "In My Liverpool Home," and I, th I can't remember all of the tracks, but it was one of those uh, three-hour EMI sessions where they stop you halfway through and with a, with a wire basket and give you nine pounds. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do remember I was uh, playing next to Terry Cox from Pentangle. He was on drums next to me, and there's uh, quite a few other guys who since have since found out were a bit more famous than I realised at the time. I think, I think even, I, think, I don't want to push. I think Madeline Bell was down there. At least we saw her in the pub afterwards. At least, yeah. <laughs> even if she wasn't on the session. But, uh, yes, so uh, we did that, but uh, otherwise there wasn't a great deal of recording with them because they were all mainly just the EMI and backing musicians they had, you know. So. Was it shortly after that you uh, you came into contact with John Peel? Uh, yes, because Mike Hart, as I mentioned, was was part of that Liverpool scene. It's at O'Connor's, and uh, he said that he was making an album down in London for John. And uh, down we went because uh, in those days you didn't ask what you were getting, why you were doing it. You just if you wanted to do it, you did it. And uh, so in the van we all did go and. Uh, we got down, met John. Uh, this is how uh, sort of lackadaisical it was. You get down and John says, where are you staying? And we said, well, we haven't got anywhere. So he said, oh, 
my floor is yours. <laughs> so, as I may have mentioned earlier, we found ourselves sharing the floor with uh, uh, a hamster in a squeaky wheel and Principal Edward's magic theatre. We're also <laughs> sharing the floor. <laughs> So had he just set up Dandelion Records at that point? He had, point? yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. I mean, he was doing something with Bill Oddie as well, I think, at the time. A version of uh, Little Help of My Friends, I believe. <laughs> a spoof version That's of right, it. That's right, yeah. Sue and Sonny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because, uh, so you, you ended up uh, being playing on uh, the album Mike Hart Bleeds. Yes, yeah. Um, and we enjoyed it royally as well. It was, it, was, it was, I think, I don't know what it was about it, but... We never did much rehearsal for it, but when we listened back, it all seemed to be quite natural because it, it wasn't one of these things that was very structured music. Uh, the, the chord progressions were quite simple, uh, and the strength of Mike's music was, was in his lyrics, I think, because he, he was very, uh, I suppose you'd call him a protest singer, really, because he felt very strongly about the fact that Liverpool had two cathedrals and the, there was so much homeless, homelessness around. And he, he, in fact, one of his... Uh, one of his songs was a pretty bitter sort of <laughs> condemnation of that set of uh, circumstances, you know. But uh, he also had a, a wry sense of humour. as uh, something to do with the uh, Yawny Morning song. It was a bit like that. There's a song called that. And it's something to do with milkmen and <laughs> all sorts of strange things. <laughs> so it was, it was lovely to play on. We really enjoyed it. And uh, when I listened back, I think, well, you know, as it was, I'm quite proud of that little, little, little moment in time. You know, it was good. Well, of course, the album's actually being reissued again on CD on Cherry River very soon. Oh, and, right, yeah. um, did you actually do any uh, live performances with Mike as well? I think we did once, but uh, we, we didn't make a regular habit of it, I think. I've, I've got a feeling we did once, yes, I think so. But as I say, not, not regularly. The main thing was just getting the album done, I think. A, I, I don't think he was a band person, Mike. It, originally, he was in a band called The Roadrunners, Mike Hart. So that, he was the lead singer at, at the front. Uh, for, for for that band, but I don't think he uh, he got on with the band situation very well. He just he just liked to be a, an artist on his own, right? I think. So, was that. so did you? Uh, was that when you uh, made the move to to London for the first time when you when you did that album? Uh, yes, it was. Uh, that band, as it was then, turned into the National Headband. Uh, we had. Uh, a period of time where we were, in the words of the old things, <laughs> starving musicians in the garret thing. We had, we had all that. Uh, who was going to? We, we had to split the extra sausage into into four, <laughs> <laughs> so that we had an equal share. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, and uh, eventually things were so bad. We, one day, it was literally one of these things where we said, right, we've got. Uh, the roadman says, we've got enough to go into town to try one more time before we all give up and go home. And we walked into the offices of someone, called, I think it was American Program Bureau, I think it was called, and we talked to a guy called Marvin. Uh, I think it was Marvin Hughes, I think it was Marvin Hughes. I can't remember his surname. But uh, anyway, th they, it, apparently th they, they had a name, but no band. And strangely, had all sorts of bookings for this band <laughs> but uh, next thing we knew the guys Marvin and uh, another chap uh, came round to, to see us at our uh, residence <laughs> where we rehearsed uh, along with Lee Kerslake uh, so I'm not really sure of really how Lee came initially into the picture but I know he came round with, with, with the guys and uh, he liked what he heard and immediately we started rehearsing together and we had some gigs and from there on we just turned into the National Headband really, that's, that's what happened. So the, the National Headband was the soul band essentially, was it? Or was it sort of uh, of originally that? it was just sort of like a, a progression, we started off with the soul band, the, uh, but Bernie disappeared uh, off, off to do his things and we started playing progressive music which was the, like at the time which was traffic, no time mm. to live, that kind of thing, we loved all that. Um, so, once again, we were part of that crossover from, from, from soul to progressive, which is a very odd crossover, but nobody quite knows how it worked, but it did. <laughs> and so, uh, and eventually we found ourselves doing the music that uh, the, the headband did, which mm. was sort of somewhere cross between Traffic and Blind Faith, I suppose. That's what we were aiming for, anyway, to market. 
Of course, yeah. the, the album is being reissued on CD again very soon on, mm. on Esoteric, but so you ended up working with um, Eddie Offord. Yes. Uh, who yeah. had worked with Yes in the LP. That's right, uh, yeah. And Vision on that. Um, was that the f did Eddie actually produce the album? He did, yes, yeah, he did. I think that, that must have been one of the first albums he ever produced, I would have, I would have thought. Yeah, because, I mean, it, it just come hot from, from, from the Yes album, and uh, once again, I think we just got a deal with Warners through through the uh, headband people and uh, they brought him along and uh, asked if we'd like to work together he liked what he heard us doing when we were rehearsing and uh, next thing we knew we were in AdVision and we were doing it and uh, there's a <laughs> I think the thing we remember most about that was was the lady that used to come and ask us what sandwiches we wanted it was always the same am or cheese <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. not, it's actually on the album somewhere, I think, it? in the background. Yeah. There's somewhere, something going, am or cheese. <laughs> <laughs> so not too glamorous uh, surroundings then for making that album. No, uh, AdVision yeah. is, is actually a very, uh, at the time, it seemed a very state-of-the-art place. Yeah. It was very sort of uh, futuristic and green-looking <laughs> lights. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, and it, in some ways a little cold, in fact. It, some studios you get the sense... Of warmth, when, if there's lots of uh, carpets and things around. But Advision was a little bit more clinical, a little bit, a bit more plastic and wood around rather than the carpets and curtains. You know. Well, as you say, I mean the studio was uh, at, the, at the time one of the sort of hottest in London, really, for the, the albums that it was producing at that point. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, some of the some of the more expert ears could, could probably hear the studios on some of these albums. You know. And, and say, oh, I remember that, I know where that was recorded, you know. <laughs> but, uh, so I what? my ears aren't that good. <laughs> <laughs> what actually led to the, to the headband then uh, breaking up? Uh, I think it was uh, Lee getting a, uh, the invite to go back and play with Uriah Heap, really, because it wasn't just that. I mean, we'd also had a little bit of a, a stalemate on, on, the, on the way the album unluckily came out at wrong time con con compared with other things, people going on holiday at wrong time. Uh, there's so many ifs, ands and buts about why these mm. things don't work, but it just, when you get a little bit of a lull, as if, if someone then comes along and offers the drummer a, a better gig, well, th that's what happened, you know. And then, so uh, Lee said, well, I'm sorry lads, I'm, I'm off now. <laughs> and off he went to join that. We did, actually didn't break up straight away. We got another drummer in at the time, a guy called Jim Payne, who later went on to play with Jonesy. Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it, it was really only only a case of just running out of steam, I think, as most bands do eventually. They just run out of steam and that's that, you know, so that was that. So was Gary Moore the next uh, musician It was, you were, were yes, because um, as, as with all these things, there's a link in time or, or place with, with someone or something. In this case, it was Clifford Davis who was... Uh, manager of Fleetwood Mac, Skid Row, and Gary, you know, because Gary was in Skid Row with Phil Linnett. And um, so when the headband disbanded, uh, management, i.e., Clifford Davis, said, uh, uh, Gary's looking for a keyboard player, do you want to go along and see? So, uh, the very odd auditions those days, you didn't actually do an audition, you just went and met somebody, and the next thing you knew, you were rehearsing. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's, it's quite odd. And anyway, we, we luckily it did work, <laughs> and we did quite a, quite a lot of uh, rehearsals. I've only just remembered the name of the club as it was. It was called the Osabisa Club up in West West, uh, in, right next to Chalk Farm. Oh right, yeah. Chalk Farm Station around yeah. the back there. There's a, a club that was sort of hidden. <laughs> <laughs> I think Marsha Hunt used to rehearse there yeah. as well and stuff. Anyway, uh, so that's that's where Aunt and Lizzie the Thin Liz used to rehearse there too. Um, yeah, so we did a lot of rehearsals there. I just lived in Belsize Park. I shared a basement flat with Gary, which is some eventful, eventful story there. <laughs> <laughs> we shared it with the pet rat in the oh, basement. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. It, uh, there, there was a good story with Gary. It, uh, <laughs> no, perhaps I better not mention that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to do with a certain guitar, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> So you ended up uh, actually playing on, on Gary Moore's first 
solo album. Yeah, yeah, which was uh, Grinding Stone. Mm. Uh, the band was actually a, a, a six-piece at the time, um, but uh, uh, some strange management decision meant, meant that it turned into a three-piece just before uh, it was released. So close, so close, in fact, to release that the artwork couldn't be changed. So the only thing they could do was have three blank photo bubbles. <laughs> of which you were one. Of which I was a blank photo bubble. It's my claim to fame, a blank photo bubble. <laughs> so was it around this time that you were actually sort of left stranded in Dublin? Yes, just after that. Mm. That, that, was, uh, that was one of those landmark situations where it's, uh, an old friend comes to your rescue. Uh, really, really was climb, climb up here, some will soon be flying, sort of the old Rolf Harris, <laughs> two little boys situation. I, I, I'd gone over because some of the lads in the Moor Band had said, uh, as, as Irish people do, why, why don't you come over and play with us? <laughs> Made the mistake of doing that. Uh, and then suddenly finding myself in, in, a, in a lovely place, as it happens, overlooking um, Hoth Harbour next to a lighthouse. Beautiful place. But no furniture, just sitting on my Hammond. <laughs> oh, that was the only furniture. <laughs> that was, yeah, it was the only furniture, was my Hammond. Uh, and feeling a bit desperate now that uh, I really needed to get back home. And Ray Clegg, who was the uh, tour manager for Mungo Jerry at the time, Ray w was the headband roadie. And so obviously well, I went down and saw them down there and uh, hugged each other and said, Ray! How are you doing? And he, and he said, oh, don't worry, mate. Put your organ in the back of the van, we'll take you home. <laughs> <laughs> so it really was a two little boys situation. You know, so it, uh, and he's, uh, I'll never forget the guy. He's a really good friend, you know. Yeah, it's very difficult. And he put me up as well. Really? When we come back, yeah. yeah so, I mean, that's a real good friend. <laughs> yeah, it's very difficult to transport a Hammond organ around. Well, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you find out who your friends are, when, <laughs> especially if it's not split. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it was shortly after that you... Um, Work with Thin Lizzy. Yes, because it, it was uh, it was actually just before the Ireland bit that because it was a it was a, oh, right, it was yes. a continuation of, of working with Gary that uh, Thin Lizzy were doing the Vagabonds of the Western World album. Right. And uh, I found myself in a studio with with the guys and uh, Kid Jensen also because he he was doing a voiceover because uh, there's a narration on the on the. Uh, Vagabond's album. That's right. It's yeah. a story, and Kid Jensen was was doing that. I, I never did like being called Kid Jensen. He just like called David Jensen. You must remember to say that because he always hated it. But nobody taking a notice. They yeah. still called him Kid Jensen. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he was a lovely, lovely, friendly chap, and we we, we just uh, we clicked. And uh, there's actually on the vinyl version, there's a picture of myself. Um, Kid Jensen and, and Phil together, I think. That's right, yeah. But uh, I don't know if it's on the CD version. But I think it is, Is yeah, it? Oh, yeah. right, I'll, I'll see that then. A, that's a bit of memorabilia I haven't got. <laughs> so you played on a few few tracks on that album, didn't you? Or? Well, I, 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 it's a bit of a blur. I, I do remember at least at least something called Mother Nature was on. But uh, I don't know what else, really, because it was just one of those things you just went and did, you just Play along, two, three, four, and you go. <laughs> so at any point, were you actually sort of uh, taken on as a member of the yes, band? Yes, yes. Uh, for, for, for about uh, six weeks after that, uh, I was actually officially a member of Thin Lizzy. Um, however, it was one of those times when the stuff Phil was writing, um, when, we tr when, when we tried it out, it, it, it was a very strange situation. It just, there's no room for keyboards on it. It was just as simple as that. We just just did not work out. You know? And after a couple of awkward silences, we sort of went, well, it's not working out, is it, Phil? You know, and uh, you know, it's, it's uh, sort of a mutual. I could see quite clearly because I could hear it. It didn't didn't actually wasn't any room for keyboards on it. And the two guitar thing just seemed to click really well. So uh, so it just and it just happened at the same time. I'd seen the an, an advert in the paper for Caravan. So uh, everything everything worked out in the end for mm. both of us. You know, so it was good. But I did see Phil later on, and it was, uh, it was, we were obviously pleased to see each other because I loved his writing. It was great, great, great songs he used to write. And, just, uh, and the, never, never replace him. He'd be a, mm. he's a unique, unique talent. Yeah, yeah, so. But uh, it's just a privilege to have actually played with him at some point, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, yes. yeah. Well, of course, then you, you mentioned that uh, mentioned Caravan, a band that you're quite widely associated with. Um, mm. You came in replacing um, Dave Sinclair. Um, 
was uh, were you did you find that uh, as David being a sort of a founder member of the band that uh, the fans took to you straight away or uh, some did and uh, there was some resistance from from some uh, and I didn't mind either ways really because it's uh, uh, people who've got their fans need to keep their fans so oh. you know it's a, if, uh, if you're a Dave fan I wouldn't be upset that you suddenly had to had to put up with me <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I was just different I, I just had a different different take on things so uh, people that liked my plane like my plane and same with Dave so uh, but it, there was a, a certain bunch that liked both of us which is obviously it's the best one, really. <laughs> Do you think your arrival in Caravan actually sort of affected the band musically in, in terms of direction a little bit? Uh, in as much as I think Dave's playing was was more orientated to the uh, to the melodic angle on things, whereas mine was more uh, a bit more funky and rocky. Uh, I'd, I'd like to get tight and down with the the rhythm, the rhythm section. That was that's what I like like doing on. With, an in with instruments, but uh, so that was the difference between us. I think. Uh, I think some reviews sort of reflected that that they actually mentioned the same thing. It just got a bit rockier when when I joined. But then uh, nobody forgets Dave's parts on on the on the original stuff, you know, because that, that was the original sound of the band was was Dave's organ sound. So uh, uh, we you just have to be true to the actual concept of the band originally, you know. So if you I, I did try my best not to lose the the, uh, the ethos of the, of the caravan and try to keep the, the actual sound of it intact. But uh, you've got to put your own thing in. Mm. <laughs> and mine, mine was uh, the rhythm and the, and the funk, really. That's, that's what I do. Of course, so you, you, uh, the first album you recorded with Caravan was Blind Dogwits and Dunstans. Yeah, that's right, yes. Um, and by the time you recorded uh, Better By Far, you uh, had one of your own compositions on, on, on that album. You also worked, of course, with uh, Tony Visconti. What was it like working with, with Tony? Because he was a, a big hotshot producer by the time you uh, uh, actually got to work Yes. With uh, well, uh, it, it's, it's quite odd when, when you work with someone who's got a, a big reputation, um, when you don't actually realise they've got the reputation <laughs> until afterwards. <laughs> uh, as, I mean, it may be that some of us just didn't attach too much importance to, to that kind of thing, because at, at the time, uh, I mean, obviously we knew that Tony had, been, had done some work, but it, it was, we just listened to what he'd done, really, and, and, and liked what we heard, and uh, as he just worked on David Bowie's Low at the time, mm. um, and he did bring some things into the better by far from that, um, particularly so he, he, uh, all producers have some pet things they've got they bring from one to the other. Tony's was the, he brought a, uh, something called a harmonizer, which is a bit of an un unusual thing to, to put on a snare drum. But uh, uh, it, it may well, some may say now that it dates it a little bit, but at the time it was something new and innovative. Mm. And uh, these things either work or they don't. Personally, I think it, it did it did help and it did work, and I think it still stands the test of time now. But but uh, it, it it does. You can see that that of its time, that, that was a that was a sound of its time. Isn't it? It, yeah. it is a very different sounding Caravan album to the rest of them, and it, it's funny. I think I know it, I know it divides a lot of fans, but when you listen to it on its own, actually, I, th I think it's un unfairly criticised in a lot of ways like that because it is actually quite a strong record. There's some good stuff on it, and uh, yes, and I, I think I think a lot of that overall thing is due to Tony's production on that because. He wanted to continue that uh, boundary pushing thing he'd done with Bowie. He, he wanted to uh, sort of n not try to just reproduce uh, an already existing concept. He, he wanted to push forward. And uh, I think he managed to do that a little bit, you know, whether you like it or not, another matter. Right. But it, he, he, did, he did achieve what he set out to do, which is. Uh, well, as you say, it's it's it's, it's un underestimated its own right, production-wise. Anyway, you know, I really like the sound of it. it it's it's a it's a completely different thing to to say Blind Dog was, which was very nicely and mixed and produced and precisely done. But but it didn't. It was Caravan mm. uh, w w with no no frills. Whereas uh, the 
Better by Far album did have th this uh, sort of groundbreaking element to it, you know, which was, uh, as I say, you either like it or you don't really. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things, yeah. And of course, after uh, Better by Far was released, and um, Caravan sort of went on a hiatus shortly after that, and you joined Camel. How did, how did uh, the involvement with uh, Camel come about? Um, I, I think Pete, Peter Bardens was just in the throes of leaving at the time. And uh, Andy Latimer was, was looking around, um, and I, th I think Richard Sinclair was already in the band at that time. And so um, it didn't take him long to work out that there was two keyboard players <laughs> who may well be in need of a gig. <laughs> <laughs> of course, because originally you, you played with uh, Dave Sinclair as well. Um, Just prior to that, in Caravan yes, itself, yeah. on, one, on a particular tour, we did, yeah, yeah. And we continued that into into Camel. We both joined at the same time. So you had three former cam caravan members in Camel. He did, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, hence, lots of people started calling it c c Caramel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so after uh, you did that tour, you ended up then uh, offering quite a, a bit of a compositional contribution to um, the album um, mm. I Can See Your House From Here. Yes, yeah. Uh, which is a lot of material that Camel carried on performing for some favourites on that. Was, uh, that was an interesting album though, because you had the involvement of people like uh, Brian Eno, I believe, was, was involved with that, and Phil Collins as well. Yes, uh, Phil, Phil, uh, uh, strangely, I don't think Phil Collins actually remembers doing the session, but he certainly did it. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> He's credited on it. He? He's credited, and he yeah. did do it. I was there when he did it. He, uh, Phil came along with, with a massive van uh, full of his percussion stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and he had it, and he, he literally played on every track, I think, on, on, on I Can See Your House From Here. And he was in there, <laughs> and he, he really, he, but he seemed to be enjoying it at the time, so I can't understand how he doesn't remember doing it. <laughs> he must have been either completely stoned or something. Yes, yeah. <laughs> See, you worked with uh, Rupert Hine on that as well. That's right, right? Yes, 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 yeah. 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 But uh, I think really the, the, the writing thing with Andy and I, it, it was a very natural thing. It wasn't, uh, have you got anything? Or uh, I, I just happened to be on the same wavelength as, as Andy at that particular time with, with the stuff we was writing. Um, for no apparent reason, it, it just seemed to gel. You know? And so w when, when I played this, uh, I think it was him to her to Andy, he, he sort of latched onto it straight away. And just you know, before we knew, we were almost a little partnership there going for a while. At, uh, uh, we really enjoyed that that time because it was it was uh, it seemed to be a very easy easy relationship writing wise you know it just just sort of gelled you know, without without too much effort you know? and uh, yeah we really enjoyed it it was great so that time with Camel you, was was that the time you you I, I suppose were with Camel at the point of some of their biggest touring success you went to Japan yes and, that's uh, right it was good, good good lots of America Japan yes very good um, in fact I got a MySpace message from someone. The other day, he said, uh, "I remember you doing the Roxy, 29th of February in 1979." <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, that's someone who knows it. it reminds me of a date that I, I'd forgotten about, but I'm glad he reminded me because yeah. I, I was trying to figure out when it was. Because that was one of those memorable gigs. Yeah. Because the, the Roxy wasn't a very big place, and it doesn't exist anymore, as far as I understand. I don't think so. No. But it was a great gig to play. There's lots, lots of good people played there. I remember seeing Pat Metheny down there and people like that and there's some really good gigs going on down there but uh, yes yeah, so it was, it was uh, quite interesting to see someone set, remember something like that that was, that was good so what what led to you um, fin leaving Camel uh, after joining the album News when that was being recorded what, what actually led to you your, you actually uh, leaving the band uh, well uh, at the time um, I decided that uh, I needed to have a little bit of a break because I just my son had just been born at the time, and um, if I was going to continue touring, I was going to miss him growing up. <laughs> so, uh, also someone had mentioned to me that it might be a good idea to uh, to do s some studying at the same time because it, it was uh, actually a financially good move to be honest, just with the way things worked. And so I went and did a degree in. Uh, Combined studies, music and philosophy, strange combination, <laughs> at uh, Middlesex, which is now Middlesex University, and uh, did, 
did that for three years. Mm -hmm. uh, I was glad I did because it, it helped me understand some compositional techniques that uh, I may have known instinctively but not formalised. So it was, uh, it was actually an un unexpected help to me doing that. And so I was able to do some more orchestration things that I was obviously incapable of doing prior to that. You know, so it was a good move. So you drifted uh, into other things. You, you played again with Caravan on and off uh, at that at that point, and then uh, worked at uh, a recording studio in Kent. That's right. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And then uh, in 2002, you. Uh, came back uh, into, into music again when you were um, asked to rejoin Caravan. Yeah, that's right. Which, uh, yeah, because that was, uh, I mean, the, the recording studio th thing w was a whole, a whole mini world in itself because the, w w we not only had a recording studio, but we had a little record label called uh, Soul City Records at the time. And on that label we had Heatwave, uh, Boogie Nights fame, and we also had people like David Knopfler and... Uh, with with such illustrious names on the label, you would think that it, the label might have had some success. But uh, as with all these things, the, the lap of the gods decided that uh, the 1990 recession would come along and and, and actually l liquidate every company around us, <laughs> 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 leaving us perfectly okay, but without a, a, any ability to put stuff out. So uh, that's what put an end to that. And then eventually, as you say, back to caravan and. Uh, I think at the time I, I just I heard Caravan were playing, and it it's it just appeared to me that it was time. <laughs> so I went and said to Pi, Pi, I want to join the band. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> was it straight? Was it easy to adjust back? Because you were you were sort of thrown into it almost at the deep end with only a few weeks rehearsal. Not at all. But, uh, I mean, all right, it, I do admit it was a, the, the actual playing was a bit ropey, but the the the, uh, <laughs> the actual going back into it was not. It was just like putting on an old, you know, an old pair of shoes. It's just exactly a, it just fit like a glove again. You know, just uh, just fell straight back into it quite easily. Yeah. One thing I mentioned at the very beginning was the fact that you've uh, just recorded and, and, and released a. Your first solo album, uh, Dark mm. Ships, which had a quite a long gestation period. Um, yes. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that album. Yeah. As I say, it's just recently been released on Esoteric. And um, can you explain how the album initially began life when you first started writing material for it? Well, um, this is one of those these things that, uh, had it not been for technology advancing to the point it, it is, it may not have ever got written. It's one of these things was to have the luxury of being able to have 48 tracks of audio at your disposal is something that any poor musician of the 60s and 70s would have killed for um, because you, you would have to have been in the band, had to have had a deal and had to have uh, had set studio time to be able to do anything at all. But to be able to sit at home and in your own time just gradually put together what, what you want to put together is a luxury I think it probably won't be able to repeat. <laughs> uh, but it started the process when um, we'd just done the Isle of Wight Festival in 2005 and I'd already had uh, a little bit of material ready but not really had anything, done any serious work on it. But uh, as the band didn't do much work after that Isle of Wight Festival, uh, it was a perfect opportunity just to just to settle down and, and start the work, and that's that's what happened. They just uh, just did it <laughs> because you involved uh, people like Doug Boyle of, of, of Caravan right, yeah, and yeah. Uh, Jimmy Hastings, yeah. uh, who's played on a lot of Caravan material. But the album itself has a I wouldn't want to use the, the dreaded word concept, but it's it's got a, a a distinct feel all the way through. That's right, yeah, yeah. Was that something that evolved by accident, or was it, or did you set out to write songs with a similar sort of theme initially? It, 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 it's it was a slightly organic process, in, in as much as uh, once I had a, a couple of tracks, the Dark Ships was 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 the was the thing, and it, it did strike me that, that that if if I had a framework, it would be easier to write. I, th I, th I think. Uh, that that was something I took from from Randy Latimer. He he, he he found it easier to write in frameworks, and so did so did I. In, in as much as 
if you've got a little bit of a guide ghost sketch around it, you can, you can actually flesh it out. Um, whereas if, it's, if you have just completely separate tracks, then there doesn't seem to be any link. But uh, there's a, there seems to be a strength in, 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 uh, in linking one to the other. And t to me, that, 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 that sort of helped me for formulate the whole thing in a way. Um, if, if nothing else, through the lyrics. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, it came together in, in a really um, cohesive way, I think. And uh, it's interesting because the, 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 the responses that I've read of, of, of people who've heard it, and, and myself included, actually, it seems to be a sort of a, a fusion of what you've done with Camel and Caravan. Mm. Um, and again, yeah. I suppose that's something that came out accidentally rather than... Yes, uh, and uh, deliberately. I, I think it's... it's uh, another illustration of what comes first chicken or the egg because um, it's an illustration of that thing that uh, compatibility that I mentioned between myself and Andy, Andy Latimer's writing was was that uh, kind of thing my material suited what Camel did and some of it also towards Caravan as well so when I get the chance to be not not asking Pi or, or Andy <laughs> if it was all right or not. <laughs> well, I'll do both. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and so, so uh, that's that's what comes out. Well, it's been, been very well received by by fans certainly, and um, I, I suppose I need to ask you really. I mean, do, do you plan to do another one? Well, uh, it's, I've already started it. To be honest, it, 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 it's one of these things. Once you get started, <laughs> you, you, you've done it now. If the genie's out of the bottle, <laughs> but to have that luxury, as I mentioned before, of, of uh, of being able to relax and and just put put down what you'd like to put down without the constraints of uh, financial studio costs and things, it's it's you know it's, it's a, such a such a such a boost you know it's just been so I'm just looking forward to getting on and producing as much as I can now you know before uh, before the big gig in the sky. <laughs> And of course, recently you, 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 you have your own uh, MySpace page, and through that you were telling me as well you just uh, you you got in touch with. Uh, some people you used to work with, like uh, Neil Ford of the That's right, National yeah. Headband, Headband, got yeah, in touch yeah. with you. So, I mean, do you, do you feel the internet is, is, uh, has been a, a boon in the, in the way that things? Uh, have yes, once again, in. it's a double-edged sword. It can, it, it can, it can, uh, it can save you and kill you. <laughs> <laughs> people you'd never wanted to see again in your life will find you. <laughs> but on the other hand, the pe people you thought you'd lost touch with for, forever will come, will come, and you have glorious reunions. You know, and uh, so it's. Uh, it's, it's a bit of both, really, you know. So, yeah. so it's, <laughs> it's amazing how, how, how our society's been changed by that, you know, because it, it, does, it does, as you say, make a, a massive sort of change in the way we live to, to be able to have such, uh, I don't know, links back to the past. And, of course, the way people... Um make music and hear about music through yes, mediums that's right. like this. I mean, uh, even as you mentioned with, with Doug, Doug playing on the album, I mean, that's the first time I've ever, I've ever done anything by post. We're, Doug and I did those things by post. I would send him the tracks. He'd, because of technology as it is, uh, we, we were confident the tape speeds weren't going to vary. Uh, he could just put it on his machine and uh, play and send, send me back the thing, and I'd put it on mine, and, mm. and the whole thing is just uh, glorious. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we'll look forward to a new uh, album from you next year, hopefully. Well, yes, uh, I'm working on it now. <laughs> and, uh, Jan, thanks very much indeed for coming on. Thanks today. for having me, and it's thanks. a privilege to have made the album. Thanks. You're watching Cherry Red TV. Thanks for watching. <laughs>